Um. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, Louise has been such an incredible friend to the Whitliff Collection. Uh, uh, to have this work here is really thrilling. Uh, she's also become really tight with Sally and with Bill before he died. And, and to be friends with all of them and to get to watch them uh, develop that relationship has been really kind of cool because I care a lot about all three of those people. Um, well, and then for me personally, I've known Louise for longer than she wants me to get into now for sure, but I did, I remember specifically learning in the early 90s that if I was ever at a party or any kind of public gathering and she was there, the place to be was whatever table she had taken over in the corner of the room and the thing to be doing was listening. Because Louise O'Connor can tell a story, it must be that Irish thing that is clearly still a big part of their family. Um, but so we're going to get some stories here, and there's stories on the walls, and it's thrilling to be doing this. The Crying for Daylight, Echoes from Texas Ranches, is a project you started in the 82. 80, in 82. 82. Um, it's described in the literature here, uh, motivated to create this oral history in order to document the methods, stories, and traditions of a ranching culture in the face of tremendous change. That she became enraptured by the vibrant storytelling of the people as they spoke of their lives and their dreams, most especially by the way they expressed and reflected upon their profound understanding of nature. Um, and so one other little thing before we listen to who we actually want to hear from, Louise. <laughs> um, when I first got to know Louise, another person that I met about that time who was always there when we were together, it seemed, was James Evans. He's the photographer out in the Big Bend area. And I was working for a story on him at Texas Monthly, and he was having his first book come out. And, and it was interesting to me that this guy who had decided he wanted to be the Ansel Adams of the Big Bend area um, had focused on portraiture and the people out there more even than the landscape. And when we talked about that, one of the things he said is, he said, well, you know that Richard Avedon American West book? And it's like, well, yeah, everybody knows that. And he goes, well, I hate it. I was like, what? <laughs> and he said, they're really striking pictures, but they take all of these people out of context, and they put them against a white backdrop, and they make them look like freaks. You know, and it's kind of a freak show. You know, um, whereas in, what with James and his pictures of the people out there, he's one of those people. He's a desert rat like everybody he shoots. And when he takes their picture, you can see their comfort with him, and you can see his affection for them and the images, and that's what you get with these images. This is such a great story of Texas ranching and this part of the country. But, but when you look at those pictures, I see one of the things I see prominently is the joy they take at the life they have but the affection you have for them as the photographer. And it mm. brings a level of comfort to the images that is really rewarding. It's such a great thing that the Whitliff has been able to do with the QR codes on each image. It's an oral history project as well as a photography project. So you get to look at the picture and hear the people talk. And it's really special. So I'm glad you're all here to do it. Thank you for bringing us all here. You're most welcome. Um, Thank so you for taking me. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, what you got? <laughs> oh boy! Here, thanks a lot. <laughs> How did this thing start? Thanks a lot. How did this thing start? What are we looking at? Okay, this really started. I was doing a little piece on my grandfather, and I went to talk to a, one of his ranch hands who had actually worked for my grandfather, and I, I said, "Terrell, what about you know, what about Mr. Tom?" Well, about three hours later, I was. <laughs> cross-eyed, I, I went home, called my cousin Nancy, who was very instrumental in all this, and I said, Nancy, we have a problem, and we need to get a sound producer, and we need to get on with this. She had already <laughs> done some, you know, some work with, with some black cow hands on their ranch, and so from that day on, we went, we started with one, one called another one, another one called another one, and it just built and built and built over time till I think 350 have been counted. Wow. One way or another, you know, to some extent in here. Um, before we go, 
Quit peering at me like that. What am I supposed to do next? <laughs> well, I was afraid we'd get here, but I didn't think it would be so soon. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Let me have it. <laughs> Let me have it. Uh, there are several people here I would like for you all to meet, but um, several of them are hanging on the walls. Uh, one of them is right here in front, Miss Georgia Lee Swickheimer. <laughs> one of my Uh, the ranch foreman who has aged greatly over working with me for 50 years. <laughs> and there, there are various staff members, people, uh, Dick Reeves who designed my books, and Steve Weiner who ran the whole show, and Leah and Tommy who will kill me if I make them stand up and be recognized, but they are like massive support systems. Tommy T? Tommy T. He's back. Come on with it. Come on. <laughs> Without Leah, I would have slipped my wrist years ago, and Tommy actually scheduled all this lunacy and then became caretaker to aging ranch hands and, and camp cooks after that. So uh, what do you want next, Spong? Well, well, <laughs> you didn't call me Spong. I'm so <laughs> very grateful. Um, That's a whole different story in itself. I want to start with your dad, because okay. that has always been one of the most striking of the pictures, and so it's, let me make sure I'm not in the way. Isn't that funny? And I didn't like that at, at first. You didn't like that no, picture? No, I didn't. It took a while, but now I do. Had he not liked it? How in the world could you not like that picture? Well, he was mad at me. He was irritated with me for <laughs> annoying him, you know. Look, I mean, can look at it. He was giving me the old blue eye, you know. He was giving me the blue eye. Um, yeah, he was not pleased. No? Well, well so he was, he was the patriarch at that point right. of the all side. Uh, Michael, right. will you play uh, the Tom O'Connor clip? This is him talking. And it's born an old Irishman that for a thousand years have lived over there as tenants on 10 acres of land and I always longed to own the land that they worked for generations. And it's like your great-great-grandfather when he came here to this country. He didn't try to acquire cattle or anything else. He wanted land. Mm. So, uh, when we talked on Friday, I had the story wrong. Uh, you corrected me in no uncertain terms. Uh, As usual. The legend had been that, uh, so it was your great-great-grandfather who fought great, San Jacinto? Great. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and, the, and the legend is that it got down to me was that uh, he, the people who fought got land. Right. And then he was a great leather smith. Is that no, that was where you went wrong. No, I know, but is that what you even call oh. him? Yes. Okay, and then he had then started swapping saddles for land, and that's how the land was accumulated, and Wrong. you said that you, <laughs> you disabused me of that misinformation. <laughs> what happened? Tell us about the ranchers. He was actually, well, he got land for fighting. He actually started the Texas Revolution. He signed the first Declaration of Independence, and uh, then got land for fighting, and then just started acquiring land from there, but he did it with uh, freight hauling. And the legend is that he did it with sat making saddle trees. And I spent my whole life going, that uh-uh, not possible. <laughs> and sure enough, and I started researching and getting the family papers, he was a freight hauler and took only U.S. gold coins as his pay. So, that you know, that was the beginning of the deal. He was really a, a freight hauler. And then yeah, for, yeah, all the way through, you know. The, the land grows, and mm -hmm. but then it's it's the Texas history lesson. It, it becomes cattle, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you know, cotton, and then cattle, and then oil. It was always cattle. Okay. It was always cattle. Okay. I mean, there was side stuff that everybody tried. You know, they ranched, I mean, farmed from time to time, did all kinds of things, but it was always based in cattle. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, when I brought that up, you then let me know with great certainty that the focus was not your family, the focus was these people. Yes. And so uh, that made me want to talk next about my very favorite picture of yours, which is Daisy. Oh, and Cinderella. If you can't see it, be sure and get up here when we're done. Um, do, I have, do we have any relatives of hers here? Maybe? Any of Daisy's Maybe family? Not. Any of Daisy's family here? No? Yeah, she was, a, she was fabulous. Who was she? What was she? Well, what she, 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 she was a ranch cook. Okay. Ranch cook. And uh, was just, you know, famous for her various, uh, her biscuits were famous and this, that, and the other. And she was just one, she was, t uh, tell you the truth about, you know, she was one of those tell you the truth and you better strap down because she was going <laughs> to tell you the truth whether you wanted it or not. 
Uh, yeah, but she was a famous, well-known camp cook. And what's she dressed for there? Me. <laughs> I was going to torture. <laughs> the hell kind of question uh -huh. is that? <laughs> it's like, I'm coming in, Daisy, dress, you know, get, get dressed, I'm coming in. And right. So this is what we got. Oh, wow, okay. And is that not fabulous? That is, oh, really? it's magnificent, everything, the color, all of it. Uh -huh. Can you play the Daisy clip? I worked just like a man all kind of way. I had cowboy boots and just a whole suit, cowboy hat, and I had a rawhide coat, made a six flat rawhide coat. I sure did like to do that cowboy. I often think about how I enjoyed out there on the old corn ranch. See, I had a good place to hunt because I loved it to fish and I loved it to hunt. I used to go kill rabbits. I had a dog named Coley. He stood up by like that. And I'd I had a double bear shotgun. I used to go all over bottoms, me and as a dog. I'd put a buckshot in one side of that double bear shotgun. That's for the, whatever tried to get me is going to get that buckshot in it. <laughs> and the other one was for what I was hunting was ducks or squirrels, or smaller shots. You know. But I never had nothing to bother me in that bottom. My mother had told me, she said, whenever you go in the bottom, if you hear some holler, she said, a panther will holler just like a person. He'll go like this. Woo! She said, don't never answer nothing when he do like that. <laughs> I never did have nothing to bother me. I knew it was bad things, ugly things in the bottom, but they never did bother me. I guess the Lord was with me, you see. That's all right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's really funny because all the, all the women, that, especially the, the camp cooks, the ranch cooks, all preferred to be outside. You'll hear every one of them at some time or another saying, I wish I could have been outside. I, I like that life better. And they were all just, you know, tough as nails. They could take anything. They were amazing. Absolutely amazing. Tell me about Alejandro. Oh, dear. Alejandro. Is the light on? Is the light on today? Okay. <laughs> oh, right. We'll get there. Tell him who he was first, and then we'll talk about how he might be haunting this okay. room. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, Alejandro was one of my father's favorite cowhands, always, forever. They almost grew up together, and he, he worked together for all their lives. Um, and Alejandro was a big prankster. David called me one day, and he said, Luis, is Alejandro a bit of a prankster? And I went, you have no idea. He tormented everybody for most of his life. He would not allow the light to stay on. He would blow out the light bulb here every time they tried to do it. And when they hung the picture. When they hung the picture. The light would go out, and David would call, and the light would go out, and they'd try it again, and the light would go out. Yeah, he was messing with us, just like he always did. <laughs> And just to tie yeah. it back to the collection, apparently that had been happening in recent months. Yeah, right. With Bill. Yeah, apparently Bill had been doing it too. Yeah, after he right. Passed. Isn't that right, Sally? When, yeah, it seemed like for months he, he was flashing lights here. And then Alejandro, who tormented his cousin on the back wall there, constantly teasing him and getting in trouble. So they were sort of set up t together, and I think that was what the whole thing was, was trying to drive Elias crazy for one more <laughs> year at least. <laughs> Can you play the Alejandro clip, the first one, not the Louise one? Well, I still, I still worked in Keller when I was 14 years old. Yeah. And I'm 62 now. So see, how many years I've been on a horseback? I never did think about <laughs> something else, you know? Just go ahead and keep going like I was doing, because on those days when we used to work over here with Miss Agnes, we, didn't, we was getting about 25 cents a day, I believe. I really want to be a cowboy, you know, because we raising horses. We used to work mules in the field and all that, you know. And, and we work from sun up to sun down for that price. But we still like being on a horse, you know. <laughs> You'd have done it for nothing. Well, it was done for nothing, that's right. Well, on those days, everything was 25 cents, or well, lots of money, yeah. He, he, he and I used to, he lived right across the road from me, and he and I used to go fishing when the river came up, catfishing. So I went with him one time, and me, idiot that I was, broke off a huge catfish and cursed like a sailor, and then apologized to him for my foul mouth, and he looked at me with this twinkle in his eye, and he went, 
you think I haven't heard your papa say that before? <laughs> um, this is going to lead us into cigarettes. Oh, dear. Okay. Well, I quit smoking 500 times. And so when I couldn't stand it anymore, I'd drive by his house and t get one of his cools. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. So, so there's a history of this. And I got the call that something was wrong. He was having a heart attack or something. And I drove across the road fast in my nightgown. And he, he actually died in my arms. Yeah, he really did. Um, but the, the <laughs> you'd have to know him and how many years he teased me about stealing cigarettes from him and you know smoking when I wasn't supposed to. And Kai and I actually looked down on the, he, there he was lying and there was a package of cool sticking out of his pocket. <laughs> and we looked at each other and was like, yeah, he'd want us to. So we just <laughs> <laughs> sitting up there waiting, waiting for, the, you know, for the ambulance to come deal with it, but he, would have, he was a fun, fun person. He really was a delightful, you know, wonderful cowhand, I might add. Yeah? What makes a great cowhand? Oh, why do you ask me questions like that? For well, heaven's you, sake. You're the only one I can ever ask this Because they stuff. can work cattle well? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Well, then, well, then we'll second Should we the, try this again? Yeah, second okay. to KJ, talking about great cattle hands. Go, tell me oh. about KJ. Well, KJ Oliver, who is right in here somewhere. He is... Oh, there he is. There he is. Yes, he was an itinerant cowhand, worked on all the ranches around. Wonderful person, one of my 18. You know, if you wanted an answer, get KJ. His son is Kermit Oliver, the famous artist, and also the only American designer for Hermes. He did their whole wildlife series, uh, Western series. Yeah. That's his dad. That's his dad. So he walks up to me one day and he says, You know, Louise. My son had some brown paper, and he kind of drew a picture of me on a mule and sent it to somebody in Houston. And you know, after six hours of eight of them <laughs> screaming at me, I went, "Oh, how nice, KJ." Yeah, okay. Well, one of the most famous artists in Texas, and one of the only pe uh, American ever designed for Hermes. That's why their Western series. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, it's crazy stories like that come out of all over the place here. You know. Can you play the KJ clip? It's the cowboy fever is going around now. Ooh. Everybody wants to know something about the cowboy, what he'd done. <laughs> he done See, right. them dumb people out there, uh, they, don't know. they just don't know. They, uh, they really don't have the least idea <laughs> what. <laughs> See, she said, well, what was y'all's hours? You, would y'all work from 8 to 4? <laughs> I said, no, I'm not. I said, we work from cane to cane. She said, what you mean by cane to cane? You can't see in the morning, you can't see at night. <laughs> yeah, he was, he, was, he was a great one. Yeah. <clears throat> Or what it takes to make a good cowboy, what it is? I told him, he asked me one day, one, one night at camp, he's asking, Hey, Kay, <laughs> uh, what makes a good cow hand? I said, a fool with a good horse. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's <what> it <laughs> that makes it. He said, he, he sat there and drank coffee. He said, you know, Kay, that cow sizes it up just about right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. The only bad feedback I ever got for this whole thing was somebody was deeply offended by cow hands being called fools. So they wrote me a letter and I wrote back, I'm, you know, I, under, I feel your pain, I understand your anger thing, but he's the one that said he was a fool on a good horse. So <laughs> that shut that one down. I never got any more negative feedback about that comment. One of the things that I was really impressed by in, in reading about this and learning about it from you through the years was the, the way you came to describe their relationship with nature. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, usually when people are talking about conservation or, or whatever, you know, it's, it's a political discussion, you know, and conservatives supposedly have one idea and liberals or progressives or whatever have another idea. Um, it's, it's interesting that it, it's their lives. This is not a political position when they think about protecting the environment or whatever. That, that's, that's, that's their office. Yeah. You know, but, but so oh, tell yeah. me about what, what was it? it was, I, I can't find my, in my notes. You said something about echoes of... Oh, well, Ms. Richard Harris, Mr. Harris, uh, just looked at me one day. Well, Crying for Daylight happened the same way. One of them looked at me and went, you know, we've been, we love to work at cattle so much we'd be crying for daylight to come. 
Then, over the years, I got six more reasons. They wanted daylight. It was like we were being bitten by mosquitoes, <laughs> you know, on and on and on. Slightly, you know, slightly different from this one. What was it you asked me, for heaven's sake? But, uh, it, uh, echoes of nature and... Ah. Um, Richard Harris looked at me and said, all I can give you about this, is, all I can give you is the echoes of all this. The rest you got to work out yourself. At which point I passed out of the car. I didn't. I don't even have that one on tape. He just said that one day riding around. Uh, but their their understanding of nature was stunning. I mean, it was unbelievable. They they really could hear echoes. And uh, one of them, we were in in the Vidari Church one time with a metal roof, and Nathaniel looked at me and he said, "We were in the middle of a drought." And he said, uh, "It's going to rain about 15 minutes." Well, we went on with what we were doing. It, you could hear the rain come on the tin roof of the church. So when it was over, I said, Nathaniel, have you been out back smoking something you shouldn't? How did you know this? And he said, well, didn't you hear the heavy air that the train was pushing when it went through? I mean, that kind of sensitivity to nature. And it, that was just one story. I mean, it went on and on and on every day. They would, their perceptions and feelings and understandings of nature were beyond belief. It really was. And you talked about... Um I'm gonna keep connection to darkness. Oh, huh? <laughs> they had, you said that, that, but maybe maybe it was from KJ, and it was the Kate to Kate. I don't know, but you talked about there was this connection to darkness, like they almost didn't need the light to be in tune with what was yeah, happening. Yeah, well, and their horses, see, their horses were trained okay. to work in the dark too. Okay. Because uh, and so they would just you know let the, they'd be in lost in the woods somewhere, and their horses would bring them home. I'm not quite sure where I was supposed to go with this one, but... No, that's perfect. We'll no, but but, but that, it's that kind of practical uh, well, no, yeah. teaching of, of, of how you get, a, get around out there. Yeah, Johnny Robinson was in World War II, and um, of course they were not, you know, the black soldiers were treated not well, and they were lost on a Pacific island one time. He and it was a battalion or whatever, his group of people. They were seriously lost, and there were enemy around, Japanese around somewhere. And he, he went to his commanding officer and said, I know how to get us out of here if you will let me do it. And the guy did. And he actually got them out of whatever big trouble they were in because his, his ear for nature and understanding nature and knowing where he was when nobody else did, you know. I yeah. That. Yeah. I yeah. They're, they were amazing <laughs> human beings is what they were. Who was Reverend Mack? Oh, dear. <laughs> Reverend Mac Williams. He, he was also my A-team. Need an answer? Call Reverend Mac. Um, I, I don't even know where to go with <laughs> Reverend Mac. I mean, he was just <laughs> absolutely unbelievable. He was actually had gone to the seminary. He did not speak English until he was in his 20s and actually went to the seminary and was a real bona fide preacher. But he worked for my Uncle Martin, my uh, uh, grandfather's brother, and the stories he tells about working with Uncle Martin, read the book, because <laughs> it's endless. <laughs> We'd be here for three days with me trying to tell you about him. Amazing human being. He really, really was. Totally amazing. Can you play Max Clip? <laughs> what is it about Cowboy that you all love so much? Well, it, it's fun in Cowboy. In other words, just like a main riding on, uh, race track in a car. You like to get a horse that's fast, and you like to get a horse that's lively. And uh, then it's always excitement. Some horse going to pitch, or you rode a, go out there and rope a calf, and you want to see the horse uh, sit down and hold him, or a different thing like that. It's just something in a cowboy life that it, it's, it's almost undescribable. You just can't hardly get it out of your system. You just can't get it out of your system. And, Every time the show come on, if it's going to be a cowboy show, I'll look at it or uh, something like that. And, uh, and if it's not or something like that, I don't pay too much attention to it. And I'd always go to the old western shows up there, town theater, or oh, what not, or like that. Wow. <laughs> he, he was absolutely fabulous. Just He was one of those push a button and <laughs> beg to go home at six in the evening. You know, just endless stories, understandings of everything. I suspect those were pretty decent sermons. Oh, they were amazing. They were yeah. truly amazing, yeah. Yeah. And then on the far side there is Milam. Oh, oh Milam Thompson. <laughs> Camp Cook. Camp Cook. Camp Cook. 
So you met him when you were a little girl? He was uh, forever. I can, he, Milan really was itinerant. He would work okay. for various ranches. He'd work for uh, my cousin, Thomas Marion. He worked for my father, everybody, pretty much everywhere. Uh, his story really is too long to talk. I mean, he was a, a horribly abused as a child. And to, I, Nancy and I would work with it where you would hear him talking to us. It was like watching the human race crawl out of the caves. He had to start from nowhere to know how to be a human being. He was, yeah, uh, yeah, he was like raised with the turkeys. Mm. Had to climb in uh, hollow logs to stay warm as a child. Uh, yeah, it's worth reading because it's, it's way too much to go. But this, the, the, we do have the uh, Milam's Revelation cookbook. And so I said, well, Nancy and I would say, well, Milam, how did you learn to cook? Because he just got told one day he was going to go cook. And he went, well, you know what? I, ca I, I called on this little voice in me, and I learned how to cook by revelation. So the cookbook is now my, it's not really a cookbook, it's, it's folklore. But yeah, it's Milam's Revelation cookbook. And, but I mean, this is just one sentence he wow. said, which was uh, it's, uh, it's unbelievable the things, wow. things he said. Yeah, he cooks by revelation, <laughs> <laughs> which I understand. I had to do that before myself. I think anyone goes in a kitchen does that <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> it happens. Um, um, yeah. The, in, the, in the far right, Yep. And I can't see that well. You probably can see it better than I can. But there, there, there's a, the round-faced cowboy. Uh -huh. down. Who is that? Because that's another picture that's, of That's like. L.B. Terrell, the first one that started this whole problem. <laughs> he's a, yeah, he's the one that worked for my grandfather, and, and I went to talk to him. That's yeah, it? He's the one that started the whole thing. I mean, I was cross-eyed by the time it was over and oh, yelling okay. for Nancy and, you know, <laughs> find me, uh, you know, sound people and whatever. Oh, yeah. He, taught, he actually taught me how to ride. When you were little? When my grandmother would make jelly, she'd get real <laughs> ill-humored in the summer. <laughs> so we'd, we'd call Terrell to, to, to saddle the horses and take us out of here because <laughs> Granny's making fig preserves. <laughs> so, yeah, and he, all through the tapes, he calls me baby. So I'm okay. sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, baby. Oh, I love that. All the way through the tapes. Well, it makes sense. I mean, that. Uh, it, look at that. I mean, look, look at that. Can we talk about mischievous? Yeah, no, that's the kind of picture that starts you on a life's work uh -huh, project. Uh huh. Gets me in all this trouble. Right there. Um, I I can talk all day, which is a problem in most settings. Um, do, are there any questions? Does anybody yeah. have anything that they're curious about that they wanted to ask Louise about, or after looking at the pictures, is there anything, or if there's anybody here that knows Louise and wants to tell a story on her? Uh -huh. There's one way back there. Sorry, could you shout a little? Can you stand? <coughs> oh, oh, uh, one had cancer, another one a, a freak accident. Yeah. Yeah. He said that the guy behind you only spoke English. He did not speak, he spoke Spanish until, because he grew up on the ranches among uh, the, the Mexican cowhands. Uh, so he was over 20 when he, uh, and went to the seminary is where he learned to speak English. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. I don't. Kai. <laughs> He's right there. <laughs> He's right there. <laughs> there right. He's in it. Miss yeah. Wickheimer's right here. She stood up early to wave at everybody. My favorite lady rancher. Uh, who else is here that might be on the walls or, or related to someone on the walls? Mm. Thank you. All right. Uh huh. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Right. Tony was your grandfather? Okay. Okay, what? Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But I don't know if y'all have access to his clip. If your clip was played, do you look for video? Yeah. Last, yeah. Uh, I'm, sh I'm sure we've got it. You can hear it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. I'm glad Amazing. you enjoyed it. Yeah. That's great. 
Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Glad to be here. One of my favorites. He was absolutely one of the best. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Yes, um, I'm also a fifth generation Texan. Uh -huh. Great, great grandfather, Samuel Augustus Maverick, also signed the Texan Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how the word Maverick started. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you tell me a little bit about your favorite sort of working the cattle ranch story of branding the cattle and how the family gets together and works the cattle on the ranch? <laughs> Actually, uh, no. My father, did, my father's only one worked cattle. I, they, he would have had his. Stir he almost went crazy when I started going down here photographing them, because I started photographing ranch work twelve years before I started this. Um, yeah, it was very different. The ranching in our part of the country is very different. It's it's more southern plantation type. You know, they didn't walk around with big hats and boots in town or any any of that. Um, very so, proper. <laughs> yeah, proper. yeah, yeah, they were. Spurs off on the end of the line yeah, the yeah, absolutely. No hats in the house, none of that. All the old codes. Um, yeah, he. Uh, it, it was really funny though, really, because I uh, mean, men, men worked, at, you know, uh, ranch foreman and ranch hands, and my father, and they do all the ranch work. But when I started going out there, oh dear. Uh, he was sitting up in the front shaking his head like, oh, no. Um, my father was convinced I was going to be killed. That, that was it. I was, you know, dead for sure. And there were a couple of pretty big incidents that I got <laughs> hurt one time. And I knew I finally had it made when he just said, oh, you okay? My answer was yes, which was a lie. And, <laughs> and he went, more cattle boys. So I thought, okay, okay, we've made it past one of these. And the next time we were working, I was photographed, and they were tipping bull's horns, Brahma bulls, big ones. And the working chute had been built for Hereford cattle, much smaller. So the big Brahmas were going out the chute, just peeling out like toothpaste. And I'm in the, in the middle of this going on, and you know, blood spewing this way, and they're bellering. They do this weird thing when they have their horns tipped. And I, I realize I'm in trouble, so I start running somewhere. And my father comes right by me, and I said, what are we going to do? And he said, hell, I don't know what you're doing. I'm getting under that cutting sheet. <laughs> 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 Worrying about Louise was finally over. You, know? <laughs> you had graduated. Yeah. Uh-huh. I had finally made it. One of my favorite stories you told me about the ranch a long time ago, and it was when we met and you introduced me to KJ. I was mm -hmm. working on a story for Texas Monthly, kind of a history of the pickup truck. Um, don't go looking for it. The story was a disaster. <laughs> but, but what was so cool was you had told me, because before pickup trucks were kind of what everybody had, you know, which, and I think I found mm -hmm. out like Red McCombs was the one who really kind of told Ford, he's like, if, get me more of these trucks in Corpus. I can sell them. This is working. But that's in like 61. So prior to that, oh. there just weren't a whole lot of pickups. And you all had a, I don't know, I don't want to say a fleet. That's overstated. But you had a bunch of check, yellow checkered cabs brought down <laughs> from New York because they had the biggest trunks. So they would take the trunks <laughs> off the cabs, and that was the ranch work vehicle, <laughs> which is just magnificent. <laughs> Yeah, there were some strange, strange automobiles down there. Just got to be That's practical, right. you know. It worked. What's whatever about works, it? you know. Whatever works. That's right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Mr. Louise, can you tell us a, one of the stories that was really your favorite story, or something surprised you, or made you cry, or whatever? Bonnie, Could you cry that, for us, please. <laughs> I'll work on it. <laughs> there were days when we did really, when we were working with with situations like Milo and Nancy and I would just pull off by the side of the road and just cry. It, it was tough. It was tough stuff sometimes. It wasn't all fun, you know. Um, what was it you wanted to know from me? <laughs> oh, my favorite, every, favorite. Day. every day. Every day. I mean, it never stopped for all those years. It was fun every day. And I mean, you know, people won't let me say this. It's not about me. I didn't do it. They did it. And that's a absolute truth. I mean, I literally learned how to interview them from them. I mean, they'd been waiting for some fool to come in there, you know, for a long time, and Nancy and I were it. And uh, yeah, so it was every, I mean, literally, we'd work from nine in the morning until six in the evening until we were just, you know, completely out of our minds. And what, five years, seven years straight? We were, we were going seven days a week. Wow. At least for 
what, Tommy, five years? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he scheduled it. You can understand, his voice is a little <laughs> kind of reedy now. <laughs> he had just years of trying to keep up with me and scheduling. And who is Peter? You've he, he, you, the, the Peter, I, can't, I, I didn't figure out how to pronounce the last name, but he was not your assistant, he was... Boat captain? Yeah, no, no, the guy who helped you with the project so, so much. He was so integral. Are you talking about Paul? Paul. I had oh. the first name messed up too. I was trying to figure out who on yeah. earth we were talking. Nepal. Where are you? Right there. there he is. All right. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, every, all the acknowledgments always say, well, without, this would never have happened. Because, well, Ansel Adams asked me out of his dark room one time and told me never to do the technical part of photography. It would mess up my eye. So I took him at his word. And so Paul followed me with the Roly for years. And the first time I ever had to work without him, I loaded the camera backward. <laughs> so that's, that's when we decided that he was going to be called collaborator, <laughs> photographic collaborator. But, but no, he was a patient man. You have no idea what he put up with, right? <laughs> Come on, tell the truth. <laughs> But yeah, and answer your question, Bonnie, it's just, it was every day. There, there is no favorite. Yes? How did you get time to work for you all? Uh, the process, like an application, or did they just show up? How, how um, did well, these happen? people, they, I mean, these people were working for my father and grandfather back in the, you know, some of them worked back in the 20s, started back in the 20s. They were, they were in their 70s and 80s when I started working with them. So um, most of them were, were generational. A lot of them were generational. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on all the ranches. And of course, this wasn't just my ranch. This was all the ca three counties, Victoria, Refugio, and Goliad. Yes, yes, yes. I got my dad back there, Pancho Perez. Ah, uh, new folk, yes. St yeah. Please. <laughs> yeah. His father was my father's favorite cow hand. Uh, and he j uh, Pancho just passed away a couple of weeks ago. Oh. And but I, I always wondered at the fact that he had lived as long as he did, because my father tried to kill him for fifty years. He was <laughs> <laughs> he was an amazing rope. He could do things with ropes you would not believe. Would ride. I've seen him ride a horse. The horse tripped. The horse did a three sixty, and Pancho came up sitting bolt upright in the saddle <laughs> and just went on with what he was doing. <laughs> so one time, yeah, yeah, we were talking about Pancho, and one time I, I've talked about it, he. Thought he was the best cow hand ever lived. And I said, well, did you, I mean, you've got him to do terrible things. Did you ever try to get him to rope a, a rail, you know, freight train? And his answer was, hell no, he'd have done it. <laughs> so, you know, it was just, it was fun. Every day was fun. I will never have as much fun again in my whole life as I did with this work. It was amazing. It makes me think, what's your amazing. next big project? Oh, well, How are you going to spend the next 40 years? <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> yeah, there are two more working. I made the mistake of telling Leah, my lifeline assistant over there, I said, Leah, bring, bring me what I haven't worked with. And I thought, you know, I'd, well, she arrived, <laughs> sitting on my desk is a pile of unused work this big, so that's what I'm doing. Oh, cool. And by the way, Graham Reynolds is in the back there who I composed sing. this beautiful music for us. And so, I, I didn't know y'all, of course y'all know each other, I yes. mean, I'm a fan of Graham's, he didn't know me from Adam, okay. but uh -huh. um, what's he doing, what are y'all doing together? What in the world are you doing with Graham? Listen, it's not playing now, but it was. Oh, okay, oh, lovely. He composed that for me. Oh, that's fantastic. For this. Oh, wow. And it's gorgeous. Yeah, you need to hear it. Yeah. Everybody needs to listen for a few minutes because it's absolutely gorgeous. That's fantastic. It really is. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, with all these different uh, ranch and cultures and they're in the same session, what would you say is the thing that y'all can describe that more than a few uh, ranchmen or ranch men? Different than the rest of the state. It was, it was a very different. Really, when I say more southern plantation, the, the ranchers were really kind of gentleman ranchers. Uh, hard working, I mean, they, had, they were true ranchers, but they were just different. You know, they were artists, they were writers. They, my father, 
one of my favorite images of him was in his living room in his cowboy hat, his you know muck all over his clothes, his boots, dusting his Dresden bird collection. I mean, you know, they were all like that. They were artists, writers, and you know, they were just different. They weren't snorting, you know, oh, cowhand type or <laughs> cowboy things. You know, I just didn't. Um, and of course, <laughs> okay. Um, so, but you know, the land was different. It, it was very, it's all green rivers. You have anything to say about answering why it was different? It was completely different because of the prairies from one pasture and the bluffs from the next pasture. And so, rivers. You would pick your heart if you were going to ride that day, but the pasture would be better. Still do. Alligators. <laughs> yes, there is. Uh, many. So, our new host father, Tonto, and I, we wrote everything. We killed coyote, called alligator, the pet geese at the Red Ranch headquarters, anything we could run. So, he was the host. <laughs> did you grow up on the ranch, too? I did not grow up on that ranch. I grew up on my family's ranch. Okay. So, yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah. So. And then he had the great misfortune of getting stuck with me. <laughs> my daughter, Andrea, mm -hmm. is the next generation. Yeah. Wow. Yep. That's cool. Lady There's ranchers and back lady there. foreman. Yeah. Hi, I'm a daughter of Henry Tijerina. Oh, wow. Okay, where He's are featured you? Oh, there in you the Hi. book. And along with a lot of cousins and uncles featured in the book as well. I haven't made it all the way around, so I don't know if he's on the wall or not, but no, I'm I here to represent. No, I never did get one really good one. You're, you're, he was a gorgeous man, and yes. I wish I had yes, a portrait. He, I mean, he was really yes. wonderful, too. Thank he, he you. Was one of my, you know, he was the one, the nur my father called him the nursemaid. Yes. He was the one that took care of the, all the, the um, brood cows, the Her Herefords that had to be watched very carefully because they, they didn't do well in birthing situations. And so that was Henry's job. My father went to eighth grade, and we mm -hmm. called him the veterinarian without a degree. He, he absolutely nice. was. Absolutely was. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Lee. Hi. I'm Denise. Hello. Denise Coward. Oh, my goodness. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Thank you. Uh, Rusty mm -hmm. and Dorothy mm -hmm. were my parents. It, yeah. He's around here somewhere. I saw him. He's his uh, back here. Yeah. 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 So it's great. I think of the next one. To see you. I hate to say how many years it's been. I, since it has been a long time. Yes, it, it has. Probably sixty, maybe. Uh, probably. When, <laughs> yeah, something uh, like that. But I wasn't dyeing my hair for sure. I was so sure. excited to hear <laughs> that I could come and get to see you and see the the, the uh, uh, exhibition. Del delighted to see you. Yeah. Loved working with him. We had yeah. some big laughs. He had many, me. many, many years there. His uh, his uncle, his dad. Uh huh. He was third generation. Uh -huh. Third generation. Uh -huh. Yeah. Go, and then down to my brother David. Yeah. So and really four generations. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> just keep going. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but so, so good, good to see you. I hope you get too. to visit with you in a little while. Absolutely. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. I'm Katie Behrens. My dad, Dennis Williams, is hanging in that room, and my baby brother, Rob, is hanging in this room, I wow. think. Um, I was one of those girls who hid behind all the cowboys and got to ride with them every now and then and watch Louise take pictures. <laughs> it was a really great thing. There were some stories. I remember one of the first times that they AI'd a big group down there, and um, you took pictures, but I don't think they've been published anywhere. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> um, it's what we call the, the uh, catacombs. Yes. Some things went a to the catacombs. A good place for them to be, probably. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, I have a, a daughter who still is kind of in the farming and ranching business, but in, in Carnes County. Um, and this is my past. These are the pictures of how I grew up. And no matter who you were, they always said yes ma'am to them to you and you always said yes sir yes ma'am to them even if you were two and they were 90. Um, what the world is missing today 
Mm -hmm. people on the block. Absolutely. Thank you, Katie. I'm Rose Youngblood Johnson, and we are here in behalf of our father, which is Nathaniel Youngblood from the Vadari Ranch. All right, good. <laughs> hey, do you have another Nathaniel story? Because I just remember hearing that name. Nathaniel? The two names I always oh. would hear would be Nathaniel's and Alejandro. Oh, yeah. No, no, Nathaniel was 18. Nathaniel was another one. If you want the truth, you better strap down because you were going to get it. Right. For absolute sure. Michael? Um, I'm Shirley Rose. Uh, Tony is my father. And when this man was speaking, I can recall, and I'd like to ask you, uh, I drove my dad down um, to somewhere on the ranch off of uh, Cross from Badari. Someone was coming there to interview him, and we was at this country home back in the shrub. And this man, I think, came in on a helicopter. And then at that point, if, if it's not him, one of the uh, one of the wrench hands or whatever flew in on a helicopter. And at that time, they were beginning to herd the cattle with the helicopters mm -hmm. instead of the. Is that is, was that you? Uh, that wasn't I me. I remember that. <laughs> I remember that. No, and but they were you know they were like the pioneers of working cattle with with uh, helicopters. My well, fa my father, my two uncles, okay. yeah, were the pioneers. So the guy that came and interviewed him from New York, was there a... Uh, yes. <laughs> that. <laughs> we, I never got anything. I told my dad everywhere. A lot of these people that are on the wall, I know them because I was the younger one in the family. Mm -hmm. And as daddy got older, I would go. I was telling my daughter and my nephew, I said, if I knew now what was going on back then, I would have been more interested in <laughs> their life. My nope. dad, Reverend Mac, they could speak Spanish. I know. They could just yeah. sit down and hold a conversation in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And that was because of the togetherness on the ranches. Mm -hmm. Someone was asking about the ranches. Well, they were all relatives, and they loved each other, and they loved the Lord. So that's how they got along together. I can remember going mm -hmm. to the little church out there on Vidari, and Reverend Mack was there, and they would do something. And then on the 19th of June, I don't know who it was, but Mr. Welder would give a cow and Nathaniel uh, now would kill the cow and cook it in the ground or something or another. <laughs> we, lived, we lived in Corpus, and Daddy would come that night and stay to help those people to have the cow, the, the, uh, cow barbecue, and the ladies would fix the food. Wow. <laughs> You see what I mean by they made it easy for me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what they do every day is just start in telling stories. Anybody else need? Hi. Um, oh, hi. My name is Moira Longino. Nice to meet you. I am actually a photographer. So I find these stories fascinating, and I'm a documentary photographer, and I love taking pictures of life. And so my question for you is maybe more along the photographic angle. Um, I really like to think at least, or I pretend that I have a good rapport with people, but how do you feel that's impacted your ability to shoot these photos? Well, see, I had interviewed, the first off, uh, I had known that, they had known me since I was a baby. Many of them uh, taught me how to ride or would go riding with us when we were down at the ranch and stuff. So our family, uh, I would say four generations had worked with my family. So we all knew each other, knew each other, and, I think the thing that really, Nancy and I have talked about this a lot, my cousin who did work with me for three years on this, uh, we were women, mm -hmm. so we weren't a threat and we were never a boss. And they, they had known us from the time we were children. And so they knew, you know, we were, we were going to tell it right. We were not mm -hmm. going to abuse them or misuse what they said, anything like that. I mean, the, they somehow innately knew that, that that's not what was going to happen here. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I just wonder if that ge if the gender thing did impact. I mean, oh, as, I think as very as much I so. Do, I do. I really no, no, do. absolutely. Because they, you know, they would not. I mean, if my father had started in on this stuff, they, they no, no, right. no way, <laughs> no way, no. It was two women, and that they had known since we were babies. 
And uh, I mean, they started on us day one, as I've told you, and they never stopped for all those years. You know, it was like they had been waiting for two idiots to walk in there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and Nancy and I were it. It's yeah. interesting that everyone has a story that I think they want to tell. And no. so Absolutely. I think it's fascinating Absolutely. as a photographer. And well, and see, that's what made the photographs so easy because I'd right. worked with them for so long that I knew where each one's button was. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I, Paul would, you know, deal with all the technical parts of the camera and I'd just stand there and push each one's button where I knew it was and just watch them, you know, go off in front of me. And I just, you know, like crank the, yeah. <laughs> crank the camera and let it go. If, if you don't mind, just really quickly too, I thought you said something that was really interesting um, that was like you didn't want to deal with the technical aspects of yeah. it. Because you, you know, feared that it would interfere with the ability to, I guess, empathize or maybe be in the moment. And so if you could just speak a little bit more about that too, I thought that was really interesting. I, I just, I just don't do tech, to, you I, know. I don't either. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I just, I'm not good at it. I'm absolutely It's probably because we're women. Just joke. I'm kidding. That was a, <laughs> it was a self-deprecating joke. <laughs> uh, 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 just absolutely not good at it. Um, it, it makes me, it's, I'm just a wreck. And then yeah. like, well, I think I just told you that the first time I had to go out without Paul, I loaded the camera backwards. Uh-huh, yeah. so you can tell I'm not good at these things. Um, yeah, so I just believed, you know, Ansel Adams told me yeah. not to ever do that. That's fascinating. And so when the oracle said don't do it, I, I believed him for the rest of my life. I still don't do it. <laughs> it's impossible for me. But yeah, no, the relationship with them, you know, generationally and families and then having talked to them for so long before I started doing the photographing is what helped so much. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Lovely yeah. photos. You're welcome. Thank you. Please. When we try to publish Edwin, Edwin O. Smith's photographs many years ago in a book called Texas Cowboys, Memories of the Early Days, uh, we had to go through Huntsville and get permission to use the pictures from uh, Mr. Smith's uh, living sister. Mm. And now, you know, you can go to the Library of Congress punch a button, and you can get all of those pictures that you can print out yourself. Is that going to be true? Of the, are you going to allow digital art to be taken? No, no. This, this all now belongs to the Whitlock Collections. Right. So it's, it's theirs, not mine. It never was mine. It was theirs. <laughs> they did it, you know. No, it will be. It's forever archived at the Whitlocks, for which I am most grateful. That's, that's great. I mean, that's a real dream come true. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That, that's more than just a little bit of a dream come true. That's <laughs> yeah. pretty cool. My whole life going, oh my God, I wish I could go to the Whitlock with this. Oh. It's you and McMurtry and Cormac McCarthy and Sandra Cisneros. Oh, all the big Good dogs. Companies. Good company. <laughs> I am most grateful to be here. My, my uh, ranch foreman over there is a bit of a character. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who's put up with me for 40 years is either insane or pretty good at what he does. I'm not quite sure which. Uh, no, no, not really. Totally. Well, I mean, like my father ran ranches with, what, 25 cow hands on each one, and Kai now does it with, what, two, three? Three. Three. Seven ranches and seven cows. Uh-huh, and he does it with three people. I hear about that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reminded regularly. Uh -huh, uh -huh. No, it's totally different. It's completely different. We're more efficient now. I mean, everybody's got an iPhone, uh, iPhone, and so we contract everything out. We don't have the ranch person anymore. We miss that, but it just doesn't work anymore. And so we contract out everything. The cow hands all go to this is this group. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Well, the number, <laughs> talk about the difference. I was driving out of the ranch, and he was riding down a ditch on a horse one time. This was a number of years ago. You know, in full, all this, whatever he wore. And there was a cell phone hanging out of his pocket, and I, some other technology in his saddlebag, and he had on a pair of red plastic heart-shaped sunglasses. <laughs> 
you know, that picture is still in my mind. I didn't get it. I should have gotten it. But it was like, oh, things are changing around here, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very different than it used to be. And Kai and I have been through a lot of changes. We've watched the major changes. We really were the generation <laughs> that had that befall us. But it's been interesting. Some of it's sad. Some of it's fun. But it's changed. They will never be this again. Yes. Mm. Okay. What do you think? Closing the kitchens. Closing the kitchens upset everybody greatly. I, well, the camp cooks w put out gorgeous food. It was unbelievable. Nancy, Nancy and I gained 15 pounds when we were following this one around. <laughs> he was one of the best cooks you have ever dealt with in your life. I mean, his food was unbelievable. All of them were great cooks. It was just amazing. What they, Milam actually would count beans. He would have the dried pinto beans, and he'd throw them out on a table. And he had these huge hands. And he'd just sit there, and he'd be talking to us, and he'd be going like this, with beans flying all over the place. And this would be the oh, bad beans over here, or the rocks. And then the good ones would go over here. And Nancy and I would just sit there with our mouths open. And that's the one thing we should have videoed, which we didn't. And I'm sorry we missed that, because it was unbelievable. It really was. <laughs> We're so, especially, I mean, it's a perfect place to kind of Close because yeah, when you started this, it's it's in the description. This is the way it used to be done, and it was changing. Yeah. While you were documenting it, yep. you went out and found the people to tell the stories, and so now we benefit. We got them. You know, it's not going to be forgotten. And so, thanks. Well, they must not be. They were an extraordinary human beings. We're going to really take was. one last question. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not a, not a question, but a memory. When you talked about the food. My grandfather always talked about cowboy stew. Oh, yes. And the, I say meats are parts of the cow that they used to make that, and then, of course, how delish it was in the end. So my mom was reminding me of their conversations, and then my grandmother would make cowboy stew. You don't see I, that or taste that anymore. I, I have a wonderful story, because your, your, Nathaniel was your father? No, I Tony Lott. Tony Lott was your, okay, that's exactly. All right, Milam was cooking cowboy stew one day, and Milam had got, Milam was up in years, and Tony was always telling it like it was <laughs> anyway. And he comes up to me and he says, I don't think you should eat that stew. I'm a bit dubious about its contents. <laughs> uh huh, yeah. But yes, I'm serious. That's just the kind of thing I, every day, all day. Well, so who on. did you refer to, Tony or Milo? Did I you listen to Tony, you, you bet. <laughs> I seriously you listened to Tony. There you go. Uh -huh. Tony was, was a, he, I called him my Louis Armstrong. He looked and sounded like Louis Armstrong. Okay. Yeah, so we would always refer to him as, as he, he'd answer to Louis oh, occasionally. <laughs> wow. He was great. He was fun. Yeah, no, that counsel I paid attention to. I, he may have seen something I had missed. Might have been thrown in the pot. Who knows? It could have been anything. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you for a wonderful conversation. And You're most um, welcome. The exhibition will be open through January 6th, and we do have some books for sale in our book uh, store uh, that uh, Louise wrote about five titles. <laughs> so please uh, enjoy your, your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.